It is the best-selling book in history. No volume ever written has been more loved and quoted. And its words, sometimes simple and sometimes mysterious, should always be studied carefully. It is the Bible, the Word of God. Welcome to Bible Answers Live, providing accurate and practical answers to all your Bible questions. This broadcast is a previously recorded episode. To receive any of the Bible resources mentioned in this broadcast, call 800-835-6747. Once again, that's 800-835-6747. Now, here's your host from Amazing Facts International, Pastor Doug Batchelor. Hello, friends. Would you like to hear an amazing fact? Virtually every major pandemic in history can be traced back to humans eating or living in close proximity with unclean animals. The bubonic plague is connected with rats infested with infected fleas. AIDS has been traced to people eating chimpanzees or African green monkeys. MERS is connected with camels and bats. Swine flu, you guessed it, connected with pigs. West Nile virus is carried by birds and it's believed Ebola can be traced to African fruit bats. Presently, the scientific community believes that the current coronavirus can be traced to pangolins sold in a Chinese market along with other exotic animals. Perhaps this is one reason God told Noah to only bring two of the unclean animals on the ark, otherwise we might not be here today. You know, the Bible contains a number of secrets to avoiding disease and living a long, abundant life. Stay with us, friends. We're going to learn more on this edition of Bible Answers Live. You're listening to Bible Answers Live, accurate and practical answers to your Bible questions. Hello, listening friends. Welcome to Bible Answers Live. And in some ways, this is a special program. This is a national day of prayer. In addition, uh, as people know, there is something of a national crisis. Well, I guess it's not something of it. It's been declared a national crisis. The World Health Organization says there's a, a pandemic around the world right now. But friends, we are still going to be broadcasting the truth and doing our best to answer Bible related questions that may be even connected with, you know, does this appear anywhere in prophecy or does the Bible shed any light on what is happening in the world today? And so uh, we're just so glad that you could join us. If you have Bible questions, give us a call. The number is 800-463-7297. We are streaming live. If you want to watch on the Amazing Facts Facebook page, it'll also be in the Doug Batchelor Facebook page. And again, you can call in. We still have lines open. 800-463-7297. That's 800, God says, 800-463-7297 for your Bible questions. And I am Doug Batchelor. My name is John Ross. Good evening, friends. Pastor Doug, you mentioned uh, at the beginning of the program, spoke a little bit about how scientists think that maybe the coronavirus kind of got a, a jump start was through unclean animals. Mm -hmm. And of course, it's never been part of God's plan for people to eat unclean animals. And uh, we do have a free offer that uh, goes along with the biblical principles mm -hmm. for good health. And we'll be happy to send that to anyone who calls and asks. But probably be good before we even get into the program here and take the calls is to start our program with prayer. Mm -hmm. You also mentioned that today is being uh, set aside uh, by the government to be a special day of prayer. I know even in the Adventist world, there are many who are praying in other churches. So maybe you want to mention that in our prayer as we open mm -hmm. this, this Amen. evening. Amen. Dear Father in heaven, we thank you that we have this opportunity to uh, open up your word and study together. And Lord, also we are grateful that uh, you promise to be with us in every situation, every trial and difficulty. And in particular, along with many other Christians uh, throughout this country, we wish to ask for your special blessing. We know there's a lot happening in society and uh, a lot of decisions being made. And we just pray for your guidance. And uh, Lord, we look to you as the great healer and the one who can provide and sustain and Thank you, Lord, that we need not fear, for you have told us never to be anxious for anything, but mm. to bring it all and place it in your hands and allow you to work things out according to your will. So I pray a blessing on the program. Be with those who are listening. Be with us here in the studio. Mm -hmm. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. And again, Pastor Doug, that free offer for tonight, we want to let people know about that. It's called God's Free Health Plan, and it talks about biblical principles that you can 
uh, implement in your life that will help help you be healthy. And the number to call for that is 800-835-6747. And uh, we'll be happy to send that to anyone who calls and asks. That's 800-835-6747. Absolutely. And we know we're going to have uh, a lot of calls tonight. We want to try and save as much time as we can. We do still have some lines open. So if you want to get your Bible question on the program tonight, and some might even have questions, is there anything in the Bible that talks about, you know, pestilence and some of these issues. Our first call of this evening is Elizabeth li listening right here in Sacramento. Elizabeth, welcome to the program. Thank you, Pastor Ross, Pastor Doug. Um, yeah. Hope you're doing well. My, my question is, did Jesus lose his ability to be omnipresent due to becoming a human being, dying for us, and then even where he is in heaven? And the reason I ask is that John 16, verse 7 says, Jesus um, says that it's expedient for you that I go away, for if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. So it seems like the Sp Holy Spirit must do the work of being present with all rather than Jesus. You know, that is a great question, and it's a very deep question. And um, even before I attempt to answer it, I need to make it clear that there's some mystery to it. I don't want to pretend that I can explain everything about God because his ways are as high above our ways as the heavens are above the earth. And Job says he is past finding out. Uh, but it appears that Jesus, in coming to earth and taking on the form of man, you know, we call this the incarnation, that he may have, at least in part, sacrificed some dimension of his omnipresence. Now, of course, Christ, being God, he's omniscient, meaning that he knows everything all the time, everywhere. And through God the Spirit, you know, he's everywhere. He said, I will be with you to the end of the world. Some of his parting words when he ascended to heaven. But when he rose from the dead, he had a body. And there's no record in the Bible of his appearing in more than one place at a time. You know what I'm saying? So it, it seems like physically he is not everywhere at one time. Now that he's, you know, shared humanity with us. So... I don't know, Pastor Ross, if you have something to add to that, but it no, is it a little seems, serious. It seems as though the Holy Spirit comes and is the uh, representative of Christ on earth. Jesus is in heaven for us, ministering as a high priest. The Holy Spirit is uh, in the hearts and lives of all believers, and that could be anywhere and everywhere around the world. So it does seem that throughout all eternity, Jesus has, uh, in a special way, connected himself with mm -hmm. humanity. Yeah. And uh, that's, that's very unique, very special. Well, thank you, Elizabeth. Uh, you know, I'm trying to think we don't really have a lesson. We have a lesson on the Trinity that talks a little bit about that. That would be a good the, uh, the study. Uh, if you'd like to receive it, it's called uh, The Trinity is a Biblical, and we'll be happy to send this to anyone who calls and asks. And the number again is 800-835-6747. That is the resource phone line. And ask for the book on the Trinity, and we'll be happy to send it out to anyone who calls and asks. We've got Anthony listening in New York. Anthony, welcome to the program. Anthony, are you there? Yes, hello. Good evening, Pastors. How are you? Good. Thank you for calling. Good. Um, so I know uh, in Genesis chapter um, 19, verse 4, uh, it talks about um, uh, Sodom and Gomorrah and um, how the men, and it says the men, both young and old, came and were doing the wickedness, uh, trying to get to the angels in mm -hmm. Lot's house. And then the Bible also says in, I think, Luke chapter 17, that as it was in the days of Lot, so shall it be in the coming of the Son of Man. And so my question is, um, uh, first, were there children involved with what was going on? I know it says young and old, but somebody said, well, that doesn't mean that there were children. This means young men and old men. But I just want to know, first, were there children involved in what was going on there? And then secondly, um, uh, what does that mean for us today, knowing that as it was then, so it will be today in the, in the last days? Yeah, it's a good question. Uh, I think there, I would agree with whoever said that when it says young and old, it's talking about uh, young men and old men. Uh, young men being, you know, they could have been anywhere from 18 to 25 or something. And that was considered a young man back in those days because people lived in the days of Lot. You know, Abraham lived to 175. So there was a large spectrum, I guess it's saying, of people that had given themselves over to, the New Testament calls it going after strange flesh uh, and sexual immorality. 
So, um, yeah, I, I think they were they weren't children necessarily in this story. Yeah, and the only reason why I ask is because I see all that's going on with the young people today and how, you know, uh, they're allowing them to have, um, I guess, gender, changing their gender, they're allowing them to change their gender when they're still yeah. before the age of 10 sometimes. So I just didn't know if that was connected or somehow. Well, I, I understand your point. You know, it, it is true that just before Jesus comes, virtually all of the foundational truths of the Bible will be under attack. Things like creation and marriage and the distinction between men and women. The Bible says God made them male and female. There's no, you know, three or four other options between those two. So we're living in a very confused society in that department. And, and I think it's unfortunate that uh, the, the adults are not trying to lead the children in affirming what their natural gender is and making them comfortable with that. Um, instead, we're creating chaos in their thinking, saying, well, you can't really know what you are <laughs> or how do you feel today? And, you know, kids are going through very painful surgeries that are just really causing problems later in life. Yeah. Anyway, yeah, it could be one of the signs of the times. Thank you, Anthony. Appreciate that. Good question. We've got E. Frank listening from New York. E. Frank, welcome to Bible Answers Live. Yes, uh, good evening, Pastor Doug, and good evening, uh, uh, Pastor Ross. Uh, my question tonight is in regards to Jesus as being the mediator of, uh, of the Father in Heaven. I, I was looking at John 3.15, and I've always read this verse on a constant basis, and, you know, I've never understood the, the relationship that the Father and the Son have in uh, administrating certain affairs on earth for men uh, I would just w would like to also state this we have a serious problem here now with this uh, virus and I also look at the book of Revelation the seven plagues and, and I make a comparison and I know prophecy is uh, something that is undefined to a certain degree because we don't know exactly uh, on specific factual basis what the times and place will be when all this will happen but I'm just wondering uh, that if Jesus is the mediator for man on earth through the Father, does it mean that Jesus Christ can make decisions for the Father apart from, uh, can, apart from him? Because I'll give you an example. Years ago, I don't want to sound a little bit convoluted, I have a, a God-fearing Christian a woman who's a friend of mine who's one year older than me, and she constantly heckles me saying that uh, I, I, uh, because I lived a life of, uh, of immorality, that uh, I, uh, you know, uh, stole things from her, like insects from her backyard, that, uh, that God is punishing me and that God can never help me or support me. So when I hear things from people I know saying that uh, I don't believe in God, and that Jesus is not part of the plan with the Father in heaven, I, I get confused when I read scripture and, I, and, and, and and other individuals telling me that the Bible, the God of the Bible is different from what they believe. All right. So that, and if I understand right, E. Frank, some people think that Jesus is separate from the God of the, the Old Testament and that Jesus might make unilateral decisions separate from God the Father. Um, the Bible teaches that Jesus and the Father are perfectly one. Um, because they're both all-knowing, their minds, you might say, are perfectly united. And you'll never see an example in the Bible where Jesus and or the Father are thinking opposite thoughts on any given thing. Because uh, God is perfectly wise, perfectly good, perfectly just, both the Father and the Son. And they don't argue about, <laughs> you know, I think we should do it this way. No, I think sh you should do it this way. You know, he says, even as the Father and I are one. And the word one there means they're united perfectly in love, in their thinking, and in wisdom. So for one of them to disagree with the other would mean one of them knew something more true or right than the other, which is, then it stops being all-knowing. So, yeah, Jesus and the Father are perfectly united, I believe. Does that make sense, Pastor Ross, or am I rambling? No, absolutely. You know, and we do have, I thought we'd add to this a little bit, um, <clears throat> we have a study called Saved from Certain Death. And maybe ties in a little bit with what you're saying, E. Frank, about how can we be sure that God forgives us? And how does Jesus, as our mediator, 
what role does he play? Well, we'll explain all of that in the study guide, and we'll be happy to send it to you for free. Just call and ask for it. It's called Save from Certain Death, and the number is 800-835-6747. And again, ask for that study guide called Save from Certain Death. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you so much, Frank. The next caller that we have is uh, Marlon listening from Tennessee. Marlon, welcome to the program. Uh, hi, Pastor Ross. Thanks for uh, welcoming me and uh, Pastor uh, Doug Bachelor. Yeah. And your question tonight? My, my question is um, the cost of being a disciple, Luke 14, 25 to 35. And I'm trying to understand that word, hating your loved ones. All right. Let me read it for our friends that are listening. And the way it's worded here could sound disturbing. Jesus tells the multitude in verse 26, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Now, when Jesus says that, he's using something that we would call hyperbole. Um, hyperbole is when you make a statement and you kind of overstate something drastically. Like if you say, I'm starving to death because lunch is 10 minutes late. That's hyperbole. You're not really starving to death. You're just trying to emphasize something you're emphasizing i'm really hungry uh, paul says the gospel has gone into all the world well i don't think that the gospel had gone to australia and south america and paul made that statement he's just saying it had gone very far so when christ says if anyone comes to me and he doesn't hate his father and mother what he means is you can't love anyone more than god and god must be supreme and he says even your own life you cannot love and of course i love my life i love my wife love my kids but Jesus said you don't love the gift more than the giver and since God gives us everything he should really have the supreme love since he's a creator of everything you know we have another verse that sort of helps us understand this a little bit if you look in Matthew uh, your question was in Luke 14 26 but if you look in Matthew 10 verse 27 this is the way Jesus puts it he says he who loves his father or his mother more than me you mean 37 uh, 37 Matthew yeah. 10 37 he who loves his father and his mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves his son or his daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Yeah, that's a good so verse really to clear clarifies that. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you so much. All right. Hey, well, glad we could help. I remember I first read that and I thought, what? I thought God said I'm supposed to love everybody. Here, <laughs> Jesus is telling me I hate my wife. <laughs> what does that mean? He just meant that the love for God, great commandment is to love the Lord with all your heart. After you love the Lord with all your heart, then you love your neighbor, the horizontal love relationships as yourself. So even in that verse, you've got love for God, love your neighbor, that'd be your family and yourself. Same thing you find in Luke chapter 14. Thank you, Marlon. Good question. And uh, we appreciate your tuning in. We got Larry listening in New York. Larry, welcome to the program. Uh, hi, uh, hi, Pastor Doug and Pastor Ross. I have a Bible question for you. Yeah. Uh, you know, you know, in the Bible, how it says, uh, when when Jesus comes again, all eyes will see him, even those that pierced him? Yes. Well, I'm a little confused by that, because when Jesus comes again, the righteous dead are going to be raised first. Now, the ones that pierced him, I don't consider them righteous. The ones that pierced him are among the wicked. So are they saying that the righteous dead... And some of the wicked are going to be raised at the same time so that all, all eyes will see him. And if that's the case, I'm a little confused. I don't understand it because I thought the wicked get raised a thousand years later. All right. That's a good. Great question, Larry. Um, there will be a small group that is resurrected when Christ comes again who participated in his execution and um, you can see not only does it say here in and you were quoting Revelation chapter one, verse seven. Uh, he's coming in the clouds and every eye will see him, including those who pierced him. But then you can look in um, uh, Daniel chapter 12 it says Michael stands up. There's a great time of trouble. There's a resurrection of life and uh, a resurrection of condemnation that's going to happen. Uh, and then when Jesus is being tried, he tells the high priest, and what verse is that, Matthew? Yeah, that's Matthew 26, verse 40, uh, 64. And let me just read mm -hmm. a passage sure. that we've got right here. It says, but uh, the high priest answered and said to Jesus, I put you under an oath by the living God. Tell us if you are the Christ, 
the Son of God. And then Jesus said, he couldn't remain silent any longer, he said, It is as you have said, nevertheless, I say to you, hereafter you shall see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. So it appears as though at least the high priest Caiaphas and those who played a leading role in crucifying Jesus will be resurrected to see him coming again. Mm -hmm. uh, they specifically asked for proof. They said, tell us, prove to us that you are the Christ. And Jesus says, okay, you will see me you coming want proof. in glory. <laughs> it'll be we'll a, give you proof. Uh, it'll be a day of, of anguish for them, but they will, they will be resurrected to see Christ coming. And then, yes, you're right, they are destroyed. And they are not uh, resurrected again until the end of the thousand years. Now, that's not all the wicked. It's just a small group. Right. Uh, that's they're part they're of They're going to get a front row seat. That's where, right. Where the one time then they don't want a front row seat. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and by the way, that frees up another phone line, friends. We do have lines open if you've got Bible questions tonight. One more time. The number is 800-463-7297. You can join us. Watch what's happening in the studio now by going to the Amazing Facts Facebook page or the Doug Batchelor Facebook page. And uh, just give us a call. Line's open. Who's next, Pastor Ross? Next, we got uh, Annie listening, and uh, she is calling from, looks like, from uh, Connecticut. So, Annie, welcome to the program. You're uh, on the air with Bible Answers Live. Uh, thank you for having me. My question is about um, Elisha. I know that he um, called fire from the heaven two times and destroyed two group of soldiers. So he did not run away from them, but... Why do you run away from a woman, from Jezebel? You know, that is a good question. Um, and you not only have that. I mean, Peter, when they came to arrest Peter, he says, Lord, I'm ready to die for you. And he pulled out a sword when the mob came to arrest Peter. But a little while later, a girl says to Peter, oh, you're one of his followers. And he caves. Uh, you know, I think part of the reason Elijah got discouraged was he had gone all day long on Mount Carmel, um, watching the prophets of Baal carry on, finally this you know magnificent experience where the fire of God comes down, the prophets of Baal are slain, he runs ahead of the chariot of Ahab, he gets rained on in the process, he's sleeping at the gate, you know, probably on the ground or stone bench, nobody's treating him very nicely, and he gets this message that after all he was hoping for revival, after all he had done, Jezebel is still in power. And he thought, oh, man, she's just going to start this all over again. And he was overwhelmed with discouragement, probably tired, hungry. That's why an angel appears to feed him later. He's, he's hungry. Uh, so he was exhausted, low blood sugar, and the devil got him while he was down. So I don't know that it was just because it was Jezebel, but she was a pretty conniving woman. And he thought, you know, I should have killed her when I killed the prophets of Baal, but she somehow was still in the palace. Are you there? Yeah, 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 thank you, thank you for, yeah. Okay, that makes sense? Yeah, it makes sense. So, uh-oh, maybe she, I don't know, if she, maybe she was um, influenced by a, a stronger power. Oh, and, uh, I think she know, was. Other, um, I think you're right. Yeah, like a fallen angel or something like that. I think that uh, Jezebel, no doubt, it was being influenced by evil spirits. She's the one who was killing the prophets of God and... She was manipulating Ahab to kill innocent people for their property. The Bible says that uh, there was no king that sold himself to do wickedness like Ahab, who Jezebel stirred up. And so, yeah, she was. she's kind of like exhibit A in the Bible of uh, a, a wicked, uh, wicked queen. Well, thank you so much, Annie. Appreciate your question tonight. And we got another line free, friends. And uh, give us a call. Who's next, Pastor Ross? We've got Lee listening from Arizona. Lee, welcome to the program. Hello, Pastor Doug. Hi. Thanks Hello, for calling. Pastor John. Hello. Hey, I'm, I've got a doozy of a Bible question for you. I, I don't know if anyone's ever asked you this question or not, so I'm just going to fire away. Uh, it has to deal with the, fa uh, the, you know, the, the flesh and blood family of Jesus when he was growing up, mm -hmm. and uh, when he was an adult. Now, um, I've had some friends say that it was possibly, you know, Joseph's kids by a previous marriage or his cousins, but I've been, um, but I've been um, like looking in the scriptures, and it said that Joseph did not know his wife until, until after she gave birth to her firstborn son. 
And um, it also had me thinking about a messianic prophecy in uh, Psalm 69, 8, where it says, I have become a stranger to my brothers and an alien to my mother's children. Yeah. So I was wondering, is it possible, even plausible, that Jesus could have been the older brother, that he could have, that Mary and Joseph could, could have just had a normal family after, you know, after Jesus had gotten a little older as a kid? Well, is it possible that, you know, she, I'm sure, was able to do it? Uh, what you see in the Bible, though, is I think is maybe three reasons that most scholars believe that Jesus was the first and only of Mary, that Joseph's, J Jesus' brothers and sisters that you hear about uh, actually came from a prior wife that evidently had passed away, and Joseph, when he married Mary, for one thing, Joseph has already, he's died by the time Jesus begins his ministry. He's never mentioned again. It frequently mentions uh, Jesus' mother and his brothers, never mentions Joseph. Um, he's kind of mentioned in the past tense when it says, was not this the carpenter's son. Um, mm -hmm. The other reason is, if Jesus was the oldest in Jewish society, it would have been very unusual for the older brother, who kind of took over for the family, to leave home and become an itinerant preacher. Uh, he usually was the one who would assume the you know double portion of the inheritance and take care of the rest of the family. Uh, the third reason is when Jesus is on the cross, he commends his mother not to his brothers, which would have been the normal thing that his own her natural children would take her into the family, but he commends the care of his mother to his apostle John. So. Uh, you know, for those reasons, and there may be some others I'm leaving out. Now, the, the prophecy that you gave here in Psalm 69, it is a messianic prophecy, but the messianic prophecies are often a mixture of David's own experience, and then you see the shadows of the Messiah in there. It's not all literally always about the Messiah. Uh, when he says, I've become a stranger to my brothers, an alien to my mother's children, you know, David was the youngest, <laughs> like Jesus uh, David had brothers that at first did not accept him uh, that, you know, even his own brother, when he came to kill Goliath, he said, what are you doing here? You're supposed to be home with the sheep. Uh, when he first began to run from Saul, it tells us he was by himself a lot. Later, his brothers joined him, just like Jesus. So um, I, I'm still inclined to think that uh, Jesus was the only son of Mary, that the other brothers were stepbrothers. And, uh, you know, fortunately, our salvation will not hinge on that, uh, that point. Hey, thank you very much. Appreciate your question, Lee. Friends, we do have lines open. Give us a call with your Bible questions. Going to take a, a brief break. We've got some important announcements for you. And tell your friends to be tuning in. We'll be back in a few moments. Stay tuned. Bible Answers Live will return shortly. If you enjoy hearing solid biblical answers on Bible Answers Live, you can have those same insights at your fingertips through the Amazing Facts Prophecy Study Bible. The updated hardcover version is available at its lowest price ever and includes the complete set of Amazing Facts 27 study guides, plus a Bible numbers and symbols chart and eight pages of colorful maps. This best ever Bible gives you a biblical cyclopedic index. Words of Christ in Red, Chronology of the Old Testament, along with Doug Batchelor's How to Study the Bible feature, and much more. Call us at AF Bookstore to learn more about it at 1-800-538-7275. The Amazing Facts Prophecy Study Bible stands apart from other Bibles, giving you the same solid answers you hear each week on Bible Answers Live. Order your copy today at afbookstore.com or by calling 1-800-538-7275. What if you could know the future? What would you do? What would you change? To see the future, you must understand the past. Alexander the Great becomes king when he's only 18, but he's a military prodigy. 150 years in advance, Cyrus had been named. Rome was violent, they were ruthless, they were determined. 
the gospel writers see his death as a fulfillment of salvation. This intriguing documentary, hosted by Pastor Doug Batchelor, explores the most striking Bible prophecies that have been dramatically fulfilled throughout history, kingdoms in time. Get your copy today. Available now on DVD, Blu-ray, or USB. For more information, visit kingdomsintime.com. You're listening to Bible Answers Live, where every question answered provides a clearer picture of God and His plan to save you. So what are you waiting for? Get practical answers about the good book for a better life today. If you have a question about the Bible or living the Christian life, call us now at 800-GOD-SAYS. That's 800-463-7297. Now, let's rejoin our hosts for more Bible Answers Live. Welcome back, listening friends, to Bible Answers Live. Some of you we expect have joined us along the way. This is a live international Bible study, and you're invited to call in with your questions. We sometimes get questions that come in via international um, wire, what do you call it, internet phone calls from different parts of the world. If you want to call in North America, it's 800 463 Seven two nine seven. That's eight hundred. God says with your Bible questions. Lines are open right now. Eight hundred four six three seven two nine seven. And Pastor Ross, just before we go back to the phones, I want to remind people in our opening amazing fact. Not only is this a national day of prayer, where we need to be praying. You know, the Bible tells us there in the Book of Chronicles that uh, if my people called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then I will hear from heaven, forgive their sin, and heal their land. And Solomon says it, or I should say God says that to Solomon, right after he says, if I send pestilence in the land. And so we should be praying along with our spiritual leaders. A lot of churches were not meeting today. They're meeting online, as well as the uh, our government leaders. We should be praying God gives them wisdom and humbling ourselves, confessing our sins to the Lord and, and asking him to spare people from, uh, you know, some of the um, fallout and misfortune that's going to come connected with this pandemic. It appears at least there's going to be economic fallout, and it it yet remains to be seen what's going to happen on the medical front. But we do have a free lesson. We talked tonight about all the pandemics that are connected with unclean animals in our amazing fact, and we have a free study guide that uh, talks about that. Uh, that we're offering anybody, Pastor Ross, that study guide. It's called God's Free Health Plan. And again, we'll send this to anyone who calls and asks. Uh, The number is 800-835-6747. That is our resource phone line. If you call that phone line, just ask for the study guide called God's Free Health Plan. And if you have a Bible question, our phone line here to the studio is 800-463-7297. Now, Pastor Doug, I I know um, there's a lot of folks talking about the coronavirus and what can we do to boost our immune system. Mm -hmm. Just last week, you and uh, Dr. Nedley spent some time talking about some practical, even biblical principles that help strengthen our immune system. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, we we did a about a 15 minute discussion together on practical things you find in the Bible. And they're connected with what you would call the New Start uh, uh, principles. A new start is dealing with the the secrets, but they're all found in the Bible to boosting your immune system. Uh, We're not selling you any products, friends. This is just common sense stuff that people often neglect that will strengthen you. If if any the common flu, anything comes through, it always gives you more resilience. And the new start stands for N E W S T A R T. New start, nutrition, exercise, N E W water, S sunshine. T, temperance, A, air, R, rest, and the last T is trust in divine power. And if people do those things, if they get good nutrition, avoiding, the best thing you can do is eat a healthy diet and uh, you know, certainly don't be eating the things the Bible calls unclean. It's through uh, eating and proximity with these unclean animals that all these viruses have been, um, they've jumped the, the barrier from animal to human. Now, if you'd like to see this video, uh, you can actually see it at the Amazing Facts website, just amazingfacts.org. You can also see it on YouTube. If you type in 
the best corona prevention i believe is what it's titled yeah. and you'll be able to see that and uh, get some good helpful information i think practical stuff that a person can it's use it's only yeah 10 minutes and you'll learn a lot all right we're going to go to the phone lines our next caller that we have is uh, let's see we got niles listening from uh, georgetown guyana all right niles welcome to the program oh yeah thank you thank you for your call um, I would like you to explain this text for me, uh, Mark chapter 3 and verse 27. Would you like us to read it? Yes, yeah. I would like to know if that text is... Our, okay, you could read it for us. Yeah, let I me read it for... Uh, your voice is a little faint because of the overseas call. So let me read this for our friends. Verse uh, 27 of Mark chapter 3. No one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man, and then he will be able to plunder his house. And so your, connect, your question about that verse? Is, um, is that suggesting self-defense of your property? And if so, um, how far should a person go to defend their property? Oh, good question. You know, first thing is Jesus did not make this statement really as a statement for how heavily armed you should be to protect your home. It was understood in Bible times that a man was to do all he could to protect his family and his home. And especially if you had a strong man, you are not going to get at his family unless you bound him first. Um, so there's a principle there that is sort of a very basic primal truth that a man is going to do all he can to protect his family. The main reason Jesus is sharing this is talking about that um, you, you've got to bind the devil if you want to free people from his house and uh, in the same way, you know, Jesus through his his power, he he gives us the ability to uh, bind Satan that people might be set free. His captives might be set free. And he goes on to say, if Satan is fighting against himself, uh, he cannot stand, but he has an end. So um, this is this is the context of what he's talking about. But back to your initial question, how far should a person go? In, prote in protecting themselves. I think that that's a question every individual really needs to answer using common sense. You know, some people live in very safe communities where they don't have to do very much. And, you know, very low crime rate and pretty good neighbors. And, and uh, you know, you can probably lock your door and you're, you'll be pretty good. There are some people that may be in homes. You know, Pastor Ross is from South Africa. I remember my first time to Joburg. I was just shocked. Everybody had alarms and wire around their house <laughs> and glass on their walls. And, and it's because they had a lot of crime and people were doing extraordinary things to protect themselves. And so I guess it would, I would say, Niles, it, it depends on where you're at. If someone invaded my home, it, I would do all I could, whether it was a baseball bat or a weapon, to protect my family. If I had a gun or something, I'd probably shoot in the air first, try and scare people off because you don't want to hurt anybody as a Christian, if you can avoid it. So um, anyway, hope that helps a little bit. And a good question. Thank you for calling all the way from Guyana. Next caller that we have is uh, Mindy listening from, uh, looks like Georgia. Mindy, welcome to the program. Uh, yes, hello. Good evening. Evening. My question, hi. My question is, I am Adventist, and I'm a reborn Christian again. And... I got out of the church for a while, and while I was out, I had a swan. So my question is, will God forgive me for eating swan while I was out of the church? Well, if if whenever you're, pardon me for jumping in, I'm sorry. The, when you're asking, will God forgive you, um, you're really asking if, you know, if eating unclean food, is that the unpardonable sin? I'd say, of course not. Um, you know, when, when Jesus said that there was a sin that was unforgivable, I don't think this is what he had in mind. Uh, we actually, you know, so for any sin, and there's people who have left the church and, and uh, you know, they've done, they've gone on dr drunken binges and lived completely irresponsible lives and immoral lives and all kinds of problems. And they go through a dramatic conversion. They come back to the Lord. Jesus said, whoever comes to me, I will in no wise cast out. So whenever we come to him and we repent of our sins, he forgives us. You know, we, whenever we sin, we get, you know, a certain amount of scarring that comes from it. 
and that may not go away, but God does forgive and he does restore. Um, we do have a free book that we'd be happy to send you a copy of about what is the unpardonable sin. Absolutely. The number to call, and we'll send this to you, Mindy, or anyone wanting to learn more. The number is 800-835-6747. And you can ask for the book called What is the Unpardonable Sin? And again, we'll send that out to you anywhere in North America. If you're outside of North America, we would encourage you to take a look at our website, just amazingfacts.org. And I think it's under our library section. You can read the book, but it's got a lot of good information there. And just one verse, Mindy, just to kind of help you, encourage you. Uh, Mark chapter 3, verse 31, Jesus speaking, this is his words. He says, Therefore I say unto you, every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven men, that is, if they repent, but the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven them. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we're talking about the unpardonable sin there, but Jesus said every sin other than the unpardonable sin can be forgiven if we repent. Now, again, the unpardonable isn't just one really bad sin that a person commits, and God says, ah, no, I'm sorry, I can't forgive you, that was too bad. Because in the Bible, we have examples of God forgiving people who actually committed murder. And I don't think mm -hmm. you can get anything worse than that. But um, the unpardonable sin is one hardening their heart, turning away from God. And that, of course, will be explained in that book. So I hope you call, and we'll send that right out to you. Next caller that we have looks like uh, we got uh, if Ifaio, if I'm pronouncing Ifaio. that correctly. Ifaio uh, calling from Florida. Oh, uh, yes. Uh, my name is Claudio Cueto. Okay. Welcome. And your question. Oh, thank you very much. Yes, my question um, is very important. The question that I want to know is if it's any answer on the Bible, in any part of the books of the Bible, about the how the kids are going to survive through this pandemic uh, all around the world, if it's any salvation for them. How people will survive are kids, you said? Especially kids. Yeah, well, fortunately, the coronavirus is not having a tremendous impact on children. Now, uh, some of the viruses were very hard on children in the past, other f flu viruses, but this one seems to be more affecting people that are aged. Um, there are prophecies where Jesus said that it is going to be expected before his second coming. He said there will be wars, famines, pestilence, earthquakes. Uh, all these things are the beginning of sorrow. So, you know, we've just seen uh, <laughs> there's wars and famines and earthquakes, and, and now we've got a pestilence. I think it's just telling us that we're on the threshold of the final events, but it's not over. He said, they'll deliver you up to tribulation and kill you. You'll be hated of all nations for my namesake. So there's going to be time of persecution. God's going to pour out his spirit on his church. There'll be a time of great proclamation. Um, and yeah, there'll be, you know, uh, some people are going to suffer, but I don't think for this particular pandemic, Children are going to suffer disproportionately uh, compared to grandmas and grandpas. Now, we understand from the Bible that, yes, disease is one of the signs of uh, the earth getting old. Of course, there's always been pestilences mm -hmm. in the past, but there is an increase of, of pestilence or disease. There's an increase of earthquakes and increase of great famines and fires. And these are some of the things that we are seeing taking place around us in the world. I mean... This is, Pastor Doug, somewhat unprecedented to have a virus that is so global and impacting so many people. It's, we've had outbreaks in isolated areas in Africa or in Asia or somewhere, but to have something that's impacting the whole world this way, it's, it's truly amazing. Well, you know, even after 9-11, 9-11 affected international travel, at least to North America. Um, and, um, but now international travel is being impacted and kids all over the country in different parts of the Northern Hemisphere are being told, don't go to school. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, our boys are coming home from university right now okay. <laughs> and it's like they've canceled it yep. for, you know, uh, next semester. Uh, and so this is going to have a tremendous economic impact uh, and the, the leaders know that. So uh, I would say, fr friends, this is a good time to uh, be sharing your faith. Make sure your faith, your relationship is right with the Lord because... You know, one of the things that you see in prophecy is that out of fear, people are willing to sacrifice freedoms and they look for a charismatic leader to lead the world. And Satan seems to say that he's going to impersonate Christ before the second coming. Well, this would be a good time for, uh, you know, people get scared and mm -hmm. some savior suddenly appears mm -hmm. and uh, folks are ready to follow anyone during a crisis. Yeah, well, thank you. Appreciate your question. Next caller that we have, uh, Joanna, listening from Canada, if you pronounce your name correctly. Joanna, welcome to the program. Hi. Hi. 
This is Juanita. Juanita, okay, thank you. And my question is, how can I become baptized without joining a church? Do you mind my asking, why would you want to be baptized without joining a church? I guess I don't believe fully in the doctrines that most churches prescribe to. All right, well, let's talk about this for just a minute. Uh, in the Bible, Juanita... Yes, uh, I've got my pen and paper ready. Okay, in the Bible, baptism is compared to marriage. Uh, in the Bible says, husbands, love your wives, even as Christ loves the church. I think that's in Ephesians. Um, and if a man said to you, you know, I love you and I want to get married, but I don't want to be in the same house with you, would you go for that? Well, I don't, I, I guess it would depend on the situation. Being <laughs> single, I guess I'm not in a position, I'm not in a position to make that call. All right, well, in the Bible, baptism is called being part, it's where you become part of the body of Christ. And then you yeah, read I in. Under, I, I understand that. In, uh, is it 1 Corinthians 12, Pastor Ross, it talks about the different parts of the body, that we have different functions. And so you become part of a family. And so it's so important that when you are baptized that you are part of a family because it gives you, for one thing, accountability that helps you grow. And you may not uh, agree with all the doctrines. I would continue to look for a church that you felt fit the doctrines of the Bible. Uh, there's, you know, it seems like there's a lot of churches out there. You know, we've got a book we can send you that talks about baptism is it necessary. And the other book is dealing with a search for the true church. Um, you need to find a church family where you say, I want to be committed to be part of this family, part of this body, because it, it, there's really no example in the Bible of people that are kind of maverick Rambo Christians that are by themselves. Bec because, you know, part of a body, if my finger gets cut off and it's on the ground, it doesn't last very long. It has to be attached. And you just don't flourish unless you're interconnected in the body of Christ. I think your point, though, Juanita, is important. Um, if we are going to join a church, we want to make sure that what the church teaches is in harmony mm -hmm. with the Bible. Why would you want to join a church where you have serious questions about their doctrine or their teaching? So does God have a people out there who are holding to the truths of his word? And I think that's very important. We, we find those who are faithful to his word. And then, yes, baptism is a beautiful ceremony. It's that outward profession that you're uniting with Christ. Uh, but you want to become part of a, a fellowship of believers who are following the word. So, you know, we'd be happy to send you this uh, study. It's actually a book that we can send you. It's, it's not a real long book, but it's definitely worth reading. It's called The Search for the True Church. And there are biblical principles that one needs mm -hmm. to apply when looking for a church. You know, Pastor Doug, we did a presentation one time where we looked at some of the reasons for why people choose the church they choose. And <laughs> it's kind of interesting. Some of them are little comical well you know it's close to my house or the preacher is uh, good looking or charismatic or I like the music or the kids program and yeah, these are important things but really the question needs to be what does the church believe what do they preach mm -hmm. yeah the foundational teachings the constitution and if you wait when he did until you find a church where you think everybody's perfect you'll never find one the part of the reason we go to church is we need to learn to love God and our neighbor and that means yes even in the church even the disciples of Jesus sometimes argued among themselves. And, but they learned to love each other and work together, and that's what made them so powerful. The number to call is 800-835-6747. That is the resource phone line. And again, just ask for the book, Juanita, The Search for the True Church. And anyone wanting to learn what are the Bible principles that we want to look for in a church, uh, again, the number is 800-835-6747. Ask for the book called The Search for the True Church. Our next caller that we have is Dennis listening in Sacramento. Dennis, welcome to the program. Hi, thank you. Hey, thanks for calling. Yes, um, I, I've, I'm 71, and my brother's 63. Uh, I have a, a fellowship, and my my brother kind of never has. Uh, he, when he was young, kind of fell away from churchy things. And uh, at any rate, I'm concerned for his salvation, mm -hmm. and I appreciated 1 Corinthians 7.14. Uh, maybe let you read it for okay. the people. 
Yeah, it says here, for the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. Otherwise, your children would be unclean, but now they're holy. So are you wondering if, because of your faith in your family, that it can have a sanctifying influence on your brother? Well, I'm wondering if my parents' faith has uh, a salvational influence. Uh, well, I know it has a little influence, but does it have an effect? effective influence uh, in spite of his disinterest, sort of, for uh, the, us two brothers and my sister. Him right. is my, my main focus. Right. I think I understand. Or is, your... there, is there an age of accountability? I, I studied or, for that and tried to find something on that in the Bible. I didn't really find anything. Yeah, that, that is a great question. Um, you know, I think the principle in 1 Corinthians 7, he's talking about a husband and wife. You've got children at home. Children are, you want to have uh, the believing, sanctifying influence of the believer in the family. Um, when someone does get older and they reach the age of accountability, and especially if they're not within their parents' home, so to speak, um, Where's that verse in Ezekiel where it says the son shall not bear the sin for the father, nor shall the father bear the sin for the son, but the righteousness of the righteous will be upon them. Every man will be judged as an individual. Now, the prayers, I, I take it your parents are not alive anymore. No longer. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, the prayers that your parents have stored in heaven in behalf of your brother can still have a sanctifying influence in reaching him. But uh, and, I've, and you I've through reminded, your faith. Yeah, I've reminded God of that and my grandparents over and over again. <laughs> well, you know what? Don't give up. Sometimes God waits until the very end. My, I prayed with my brother the day he died. Uh, and he asked me to pray with him then where he used to make fun of my religion. So don't get discouraged. Yeah. Sometimes God answers those prayers at the 11th hour. And right. uh, just you continue to pray for your brother. and But he is at the age of accountability now, so um, he needs to is, c come to the Lord. Yeah. Is there some verses that having to do with an age of accountability? The only, I found something about kids of age seven, and I think that's a little young. Well, I don't know where you found that, but, you know, the closest thing I can think of is when it's Jesus was 12. Runner, it says something about when kids are seven? I, I think it does. Well, yeah. I, I know that uh, in the biblical way of doing things, when a child, a, a boy, reached the age of 12, he would often accompany his father for sacrifices. And in the case of Jesus, he went to the temple when he was 12. And I think in the Jewish mind, and again, it's not a hard age because every child is a little different. Mm -hmm. But when we're working with children, preparing them for baptism, we want them to be able to make the decision for themselves, understand the importance of their decision. And um, probably somewhere around 10, 12, uh, depending upon the Old child. Old enough to understand sin and repent of their sins right. and ask for, for forgiveness when they know the difference between right and wrong and what the, um, what the stakes are. Uh, you know, God is good. He judges us by those things. Hey, thank you so much, Dennis. Hope that helps a little bit. And we'll pray for your brother, too. We've got Robert listening in Washington. Robert, welcome to the program. Hey, Robert. Hello, pastors. I think we got time for a short question before we sign off, so we better get to it. Okay, I just wanted you to explain to me, uh, John sixteen thirty three, um, why should uh, we be of good cheer because Christ has overcome the world? What does it mean that Christ has overcome the world? Well, I think it's, he, of course, was victorious in living in this world. You know, the world's always trying to bring people down and turn them to sin and make us give up our convictions and, and worldliness. You know, the Bible says, love not the world or worldliness. Jesus was not impacted by it. He lived a sinless life. He overcame the world. And he said, because I've overcome the world, I can now die as your sacrifice and provide forgiveness for your sins. So cheer up. Uh, we win in the end is what he's saying. I, we know how the story ends. Um, you got anything you want to add? Yeah, I was just going to add to that. You know, in this life, we do have trials and tribulations. We're living in a sin-polluted world. But because Jesus has overcome the world, we have hope of forgiveness and grace and eternal life. Mm -hmm. And that is something for us to be or have good cheer about or be happy about. So, you know, that's, this is probably a very appropriate verse for the things that our world is going through right now. There's a lot of fear out there and people are worried about 
what's going to happen tomorrow and what's going to happen with my investments and my health. But Jesus says, the good news is, uh, we know the way the story ends. He has overcome the world and he promises to give victory, the greatest victory of all is eternal life to those who trust in him. Amen. And, and you know, the other thing is people say, oh, if I'm a Christian, it says I'll have tribulation. I think people forget, he says, in the world you'll have tribulation. Everybody's got tribulation. Mm. Everyone has problems. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I'll see a person, I'll think, boy, that couple, they got everything they want. They got it made. They're living large. They're, you know, they're rich and healthy. And then you find out, boy, they got some serious problems right. you knew nothing about. It seems like everybody's got problems and you you know the life is like going down a river and you're going to have rapids and some calm water and some more rapids and you just learn to enjoy the ride trust the lord along the way and uh just pray that you can be you know a good witness and do his work but don't be discouraged when when god told joshua i want you to lead the people into the promised land he told them joshua chapter one i think four or five times he says be courageous be courageous be very courageous and that's like saying cheer up don't be discouraged. You're going to win. Mm -hmm. They had a lot of battles, but they won. And he retired in uh, a, a peaceful meadow. So, <laughs> you know, cheer up, friends. I know that uh, we're hearing the news, and most news is not good news these days. There's all kinds of uh, fear and foreboding. When Jesus was in the boat with the disciples on that stormy sea, uh, they were fearing for their lives, and they woke up the Lord and asked, Lord, do you not care that we're perishing? And he woke up and calmed the ocean and said, where is your faith? So friends, cheer up. All is going to be well. God is going to, he, he's on the throne. And at the same time, remember, we need to keep the word going out. Some people get so frightened during times like this, they forget to support their churches and Christian ministries. Where would we be if programs like this suddenly aren't on the air? Because in the panic, people forget. Mm -hmm. And so we do appreciate your remembering to support uh, ministries like Amazing Facts and others that are bringing spiritual hope to millions. You can go to the website, amazingfacts.org, and you can tell us you enjoy the program. Click, donate, keep us on the air. God willing, we'll talk and study next week. Thank you for listening to today's broadcast. We hope you understand your Bible even better than before. Bible Answers Live is produced by Amazing Facts International, a faith-based ministry located in Granite Bay, California. Hello friends, Pastor Doug Batchelor here with Amazing Facts. Corrine was divorced, pregnant, and very concerned about her future. But God saw her in her desperate loneliness and confusion and he used a coworker to share an Amazing Facts DVD that led Corrine to our website. Here at the website, she studied our life-changing free online Bible studies. What she learned there transformed her heart, and today, Corrine has a lasting peace. She's baptized and part of a nurturing church family. Now you, friend, have an opportunity to help someone today and to make an eternal difference for more people like Corrine. Your simple investment of faith in Amazing Facts will keep growing and reaching more people with God's life-changing Word. Would you prayerfully consider sending a gift today to help others know Christ and the wonderful truth that changes hearts? And it's easy to make a donation. Give us a call at 877-506-1751. The number again, 877-506-1751. Or just visit give.amazingfacts.org or send your gift to P.O. Box 1058, Roseville, California, 95678. Thank you for studying the Word of God with me today. And I hope that you'll plan now to join me again next week as we discover more amazing facts from the Word of God. For life-changing Christian resources, visit afbookstore.com. If you'd like to enhance your study of God's Word, visit our website at www.amazingfacts.org and sign up for our free Bible study course. And make sure to check out our online bookstore at afbookstore.com which offers thousands of inspiring books, DVDs, and more to help you get the most out of God's Word. To take advantage of the offers you've heard on this broadcast, 
call us at 800-835-6747 or visit our website at amazingfacts.org. Did you enjoy this program? Make sure to tell your family and friends. Tune in next time for more Bible Answers Live, honest and accurate answers to your Bible questions.